all these efforts have got to go forward um, independently but integrated. And this, the four panelists that you're going to be hearing are going to give you some wonderful case studies where that's happening. Uh, I've spent about 25 years trying to harness collaborative work. Right now I'm working in the cyber area because it seems to be one area where you don't have to really educate anybody to the needs. Uh, but cyber is something that we all are aware of, but we're not quite sure how we're going to be using it in another few years. Uh, more and more I'm seeing from the policy point of view uh, governments and businesses are finally getting together, I guess they're scared enough to do that, to realize that they have to work together but they don't have to work on a global sense because that's imp totally impossible. And uh, as a result, uh, we have uh, efforts such as the one led by Carl Bildt and John Baird last month in Ottawa where they, they put together a lot of uh, different efforts going on in the internet te technology from health, from uh, resilience, from disaster. And uh, they came up with this wonderful thought, which we've all been looking for. In the long term, this infrastructure is what we need to preserve. That's the, the uh, internet. If we are going to ensure that the internet remains innovative, free, and open for the benefits of all users. And that's, that's where you all come in. It is this multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance that ensures that no one organization can effectively control the internet. So I'm pleased to uh, turn it over to the dazzling uh, panel. And I guess, uh, May, you're starting first. Doctor, I'm yes, if you would. I was, I was the fourth. OK, OK. Let's just keep you alert. OK. <laughs> okay. So thank you, thank the, the organizers for inviting me. So I think uh, it's great I can follow this uh, short presentation after the two keynote speakers. And so in, I, in data analysis, uh, most of the time we're knowing people are talking about you have big data, you do extract some metadata, you go ahead and make a decision. In fact, uh, the real like uh, data, the entire interpretation from the raw data to the final decision making involves five steps. So the first one is uh, data which we are really talking about, there's some technical challenges behind it. Why is it related to data quality control? Why is it related to when you have a large population of certain conditions? How do you actually design your experiment so you can get the right distribution representing your population? After that, this is the information extraction, which is related to how do you extract your metadata. Uh, most of the time, people directly jump from here, just saying, hey, let's make a decision, move forward. However, in biomedical area, the medicine itself is very specialized. It's actually significantly dependent on the particular knowledge about that disease or condition. So that's why there's an important step involved. That's actually how do you move from teacher to knowledge, mapping to the exactly medical knowledge. However, we all know that we can all read books to acquire knowledge, but knowledge is not equal to decision. When we come to the decision making, and there's also one important step that's involved the feedback, which is not every single decision is actionable. So that's actually the entire process. I use a simple diagram to show here. I actually can tell you that I have been working in this area for close to 30 years. The day one I, would I entered this field, that's what I learned from my professor back then. Now I'm a professor myself, it hasn't changed. In fact, it's keep proving how important we have to address every single step of it. IBM Watson is uh, taking a step from information to knowledge, but for medicine, the, that particular step is more significantly complex in IBM Watson. And then, however, I must say, only during the last uh, 12, 13 years, I learned there are two other P words that's very important, that's exactly actually related to what the ancestors mentioned in medicine, people and the policy. No matter how excellent system we design, when we put it in the clinical trial, we are actually depending on our nurses to help us. If they are not exactly following the protocol, we are not still be able to make a use of it. Of course, the policy is a big issue. So then, 
Uh, actually, I, do, I put one slide to quickly introduce myself, mainly to <laughs> say that, mainly to say that part of the thing I'm going to quickly summarize is based on a large center I have been working on for the last 10 years. So as a result of that, I do want to like uh, point it out. Our work over the years, I realized that to make uh, things happen, exactly as I am pointed out, it takes a village. It's not just pure academic research in the ivory tower out of touch of the real world. In fact, we have to work with uh, the real hospitals to do through the trial to validate what we're doing. And at the same time, we also have to work with the industry to make sure our system is actually finally can get into market to impact the, the real society. So now, let me actually just quickly summarize a very interesting thing I have been following during the last 10 years. 2007, Institute of Medicine projected a vision what, how we can save the U.S. healthcare system. This actually is summarized into five simple messages, which is the first one, we need the best evidence. We actually need to deliver the individualized patient care. We also need to go from the reactive treatment to proactive prevention and health promotion. And also, as the, the other speaker pointed out, the V word, we need to deliver value rather than fee-based service. And also, last thing is, we have to learn through delivery. Basically, that's referring to that feedback system. Every time we deliver, we get feedback, we improve our system. However, with all this vision, things should be so. However, this is the reality check. In actually a few years later, the World Health Organization come back to say, hey, US, you are actually the healthcare cost is number one in the whole world, but you actually your outcome is 37 in terms of ranking in the world. So then IOM come back say, what's the, the problem? Because we already analyzed this, started this. We know these are the five issues. They realize it's actually three reasons. One reason is right now, Despite all the genomic, omic, all this uh, after human genome project, we're talking about a revolution in terms of medicine itself. We're going to move to molecular medicine. We're going to go for personalized medicine. Despite all the scientific discovery, until this moment, the insights are poorly managed. It's far away from real translation, the real work. And second thing, in terms of real clinical care right now, the evidence are poorly utilized. And then the third thing is, the care itself is a poorly captured experience because there are a lot of uh, failing gap the, the issues in the real practice. As I pointed out, how do we move to information, to knowledge, to decision making, through feedback to find out what's the action of our atoms. So that's why there was a lot of discussion said, okay, now we have a huge, huge more technology being developed because I'm actually in biomedical engineer field. However, that, that the people say, can we actually utilize all this data to help us fix all these issues? However, the reality is, it's actually accelerated the data explosion. It's actually not really get us there because some other challenges. Right now, if you're talking about uh, genomics alone, the speaker before us just mentioned about that. I work in that area for now close to 15 years. In fact, at this particular year, at this moment, we're generating 15 petabytes of data alone on the omic side. And then if you look at the increase rate, it's actually threefold. Next year, it's going to be 45 petabytes of data being generated. And then there is a prediction that in 10 years, we're going to have one zettabyte of health-related data. What's that number mean? One zettabyte equal to 1,000 petabyte equal to 1 million petabyte equal to 1 trillion terabytes. That's how much data we're talking about. So, as I said, because the early speaker already mentioned about the four we, I'm just going to quickly say that. This is the kind of data we're dealing with in the predictive health as well as the hospital care at this moment. One is definitely related to volume. Second is related to variety. Third one is related to velocity because the data in medicine is being measured in totally different time scale. Some require the daily monitoring, like a heartbeat for a critical care patient. Some, however, related, require only annual or even 10-year, five-year monitoring. How are we dealing with that? The fourth we, I do use a different word than the early speaker. He was using value. That's a very important word. 
I'm using a technical word, veracity, because we're talking about the data integrity. There's a huge problem right now in the medical field. Right now, we have 25% average data missing in our record. In addition to that, we have half a million medical deaths are related to medical errors. That's being estimated in early this year. So then, there's another issue is this from data integration. How do we get from data to information to knowledge to decision? Of course, in medicine, data security and privacy is a big issue. So that's why, ultimately, what is biomedical big data? We're really talking about a complex and that's unstructured data. I'm actually to quickly, as Anne suggested, I use a quick like an example here. Many of you all know about MIT developed this major resource for the community or for intensive care unit study called MIMIC, which stands for multi-parameter intelligent monitoring in intensive care. Emory, a few years back, trying to do this, changing the platform from reactive to proactive. So we actually did a lottery. Unfortunately, I, was, I didn't get into the lottery myself. I wish I could. It's totally lottery. Extract 700 healthy employees. All these employees, Emory will provide the fund, do a close monitoring for those employees. We are actually talking about like 700 patients, uh, more than 800 variables being measured about the, this employee. And then we did a lot of uh, molecular from the genomic, uh, transferome, proteomic, metabolomic, mesolome, as well as the imaging for the patient. Uh, for the healthy employees, healthy people. We want to see after 10 years, what kind of disease is being developed? Can we find a trend so we can do prevention? So at this moment, all we have are data. How much data we're talking about? We're talking about more than 2 million variables we have to deal with. And unfortunately, what are the challenges? Because these are not, we cannot do a very good control study, as I have been working on, on cardiovascular and cancer. We don't have a whole disease population versus a whole healthy population. There's a big contrast. I can develop data mining, intelligent data mining to do the classification. Now we're all talking about healthy employees. However, there's a progression of a disease, which actually is very hard because now the contrast is very small. How do we do that? Until, until now, we still have a multidisciplinary researchers consists of a gen geneticist, the clinicians, the metabolomist and the people like me who are data analysts, we are working together on this. So this is just a quick summary on all these diseases we're looking, tracking now, from immune, metabolomic, cardiovascular, muscular, respiratory, mental, and then looking at all this data together. These are just a quick uh, screen capture. I'm going to give Anne my slide later so she can take a look, closer look for the case study here. And then while we're doing all this, when I talk about the unstructured complex data, a lot of people say, yes, that's hard. We do the analysis, we, do, we need to go through all this basic analysis to find it. But is data complexity the only challenge? Actually, the truth is, it's not. Give a simple example. While we're I have been asked to lead FDA, the data analytics for clinical genomics, regulatory like a documentation. To do that, this is what FDA asked me to do. That's why I'm helping this whole Predictive Health Institute to convert and analyze this, their data. What's the challenge here? They're actually having three different possibilities from gene, the transcriptome, isoform. There are also multiple platforms from Illumina, Roche, Life Technologies. After we did all these things, make a guess how much we end up to have choices in terms of a possible data analysis algorithm exists. We're talking about the 72,000 algorithms. Which one are you going to utilize to these people so you can actually reproduce for the clinical, very, the real reliability and reproducibility? So that's actually what a cha the challenge I have been helping FDA for the last seven years to de de investigate this. Right now, we apply this to our study. For next gene sequencing data alone, 72,000 we need to decide. For the other clinical variable, we have 4,000 algorithms. We have to decide which one to utilize. So we can include clinical reliability and reproducibility. So that's why when we're talking about big data, it's beyond unstructured and complex data, there are also the algorithm. Let me just quickly mention one thing. Remember, we all have a limited resource to convert a, a real the employees of 
example, to the sequencing data alone, it costs uh, $5,000 per patient, per person. And then, as a result, this is a very simple example I want to show you, mentioning about another challenge related to the data sampling and the analysis. How do we trust data analytics? What kind of challenge we're facing? Simple example, when we do the pilot study, we have to look into our big sample database, pick up a small group of it for pilot study. I did a wonderful job as much as I do. However, when I did my pilot study sample, I may not exactly get the exactly right distribution. So no matter how good a job I do, the moment I got the real distribution, there is discrepancy. So what's the challenge we're facing? We did initially pilot study. We did the best job we do. We finally find a decision threshold. That decision threshold is an indicator to say the, pay, the employees start developing a condition. However, the moment it's for the real population, the distribution is not exactly the same. It's fail because of this. We have to be able to find the analytics to be robust to represent what's happening. That's what it is uh, learning. So that's why we develop a system. This is a quick show of the, the outcome. And, uh, and then the fundamental idea, that's one challenge I was talking. Second challenge, we started with a population statistic, but every patient is different, have a different kind of comorbidity. So that's why, what's the strategy here? The strategy is start with population, but have to look at the individual conditions, and together, we have to combine the current clinical practice plus a real feedback system through the medical doctors who has a real knowledge to finally do a case-based reasoning. So that's actually the current state of art and open field for the biomedical big data analytics field. So then eventually we have to put everything together, genotype, phenotype in one dashboard. So users, clinicians, as well as the, the patients can use this. While we develop this uh, system, the Georgia, uh, actually Georgia, state of Georgia, the health system CEOs ask us to convert it also for two other stakeholders. Besides the physicians and the patients, they ask us to develop one for the payers as well as for the hospital. So we're in the process of developing it. Okay, let me summarize for you. So basically, remember I said that this is three challenges. IOM this come out after the WHO reported the issues. One is related to better science insight. So key is to do a better integration, better knowledge modeling, better decision making. Second one is related to how do we do better evidence. We need to start with population statistics, but we have to develop a case-based reasoning customized to a particular a person. And the third one, very importantly, we also need it through the healthcare delivery system to do a better healthcare evidence delivery, we have to do a real-time decision making to solicit the real-time feedback from real expert on the spot. So with that, that's my key messages to present to you for discussions. Thank you. because I just, as I said to you, gone through this experience, you have to go to those clinicians who are ready for this, who are advancing, and then you have to educate the patient and the patient family. Okay, actually it's interesting. I just took those slides out because of the number of slides, but I actually I have a, a happened to work on this also. Yes. Uh, right now, there is one uh, survey, national survey, on the physician's satisfaction about this particular dis area. Do they want to have their kids to be a physician later on. Uh, make a guess how much percentage of uh, satisfaction rate. 15. Actually, 6%. Yeah. So one issue actually is related to now physicians are complaining about with all the new technology available, they're spending more time typing in the data, input into the EHR, than treating patient. They they actually spending more time on that. So that's the reason why in terms of education, we actually, it's become an important issue because I was asked to give a talk in the CEO forum for all the healthcare system 
uh, in the U.S. And in that particular uh, the forum, I was discussing how to educate physicians, how to educate the patients. We have a way to do that for a patient. We actually talking about develop the inter interactive system to teach them how to do it. For physicians, we actually develop a simple system for them to get a real-time interactive feedback help when they're learning new system. But in fact, interesting enough, I have a CEO come to me say, Dr. Wang, you forgot another two important stakeholders. One are the decision maker in hospital like us. We are the one decide how much resource we allocate for these physicians to get support, to learn, to do the education. Second one, you forgot the payers. Payers are right now are unwilling to pay for the genomic test, are willing to do that because they didn't see an immediately benefit to them. So as a result of it, I actually did invest the time in actually finding out the way to help them. So one challenge, right now the issue is we're talking about the three levels of education approach. One, are targeted for technical people. We do talking about the developing MOOC system. Many of you heard about that, right? For the technical. Second one, we are talking about to develop something like a, a boot camp for those uh, uh, people who actually don't have much time, but in the important position to learn this. And then third thing, we actually right now promote something that hasn't been probably mentioned in medical field a lot called open science, open data, open tool, so that the education can become as simple as right now we're using iPad, as a app on the iPad, as well as how we are sometimes like people love to play games. So that's the three strategies. That is phenomenal. And later after, after everyone talks, maybe at lunch we can take some more questions. Dr. Wong, thank you so much. Thank you. Holly, would you go next? Sure. Thank you. Come around here. Come around here. So I'm, I'm just going to go through a couple of slides to um, give you an idea of this new approach to healthcare. It is changing from being hospital centric, clinic centric, to much of the uh, care moving toward the home. Health interventions that monitor people in real time, give appropriate just in time feedback, and are tailored to individuals. We know that this helps address the vast majority of health issues. You know, most of our healthcare dollars are being spent on chronic conditions where health behavior change interventions are really critical. You saw earlier this morning that just when you're looking at mortality, health behaviors account for 40%. When you start thinking about quality of life and reducing costs, it gets even larger. So um, the types of, um, interventions that rely on sensors and monitoring, not, not only self-report, but data streaming data from the home is, becomes a big data challenge. It's the algorithms in the middle that, um, you know, typically you can use a mobile phone as a data aggregator or a computer in the home. Um, and it's these, the types of algorithms that estimate patient state, estimate behaviors, that become really critical in this type of um, approach. Um, I'm going to quickly run through some sample sensors that you might not have thought of. This particular slide, certainly, we all know the Fitbit, Nike fuel bands, and um, but you know maybe the body body media link armband, where you're looking not only at physical activity, calorie steps, the usual, but also heat flux, skin temperature, galvanic skin response. Some of the watches now are measuring heart rate, once you get that, you get heart rate variability in a very convenient way. Heart rate variability in turn allows you to estimate stress levels. Not only exercise, but stress and stress recovery at night. 
um, you can infer sleep stage. And many of these measurements you'll notice are indirect. But when you're measuring somebody continuously over time, you can get more and more accurate. And the beauty of these kinds of approaches is you're using the individual as their own control. You're not comparing them with these standard medical tests where you come into a clinic, an unusual situation, you measure a blood pressure. There's the white coat phenomenon. It's usually higher than normal. But there's a lot of variability in blood pressure, as an example, during the day. Physician, and you're getting this maybe once a year. It's not very representative. And, and yet we're trying to treat based on these pinpoint time samples. And in, um, in my area of work where we're doing a lot of neuropsychological testing, the standard methods are notoriously biased and culturally dependent and unrepresentative. So um, it's in interesting to think about the trade-offs between the ubiquity of the measurement that you can make in the home and the accuracy that you might get in a clinical situation, but it's um, biased and um, not necessarily representative. Um, many sensors, as long as you're carrying around a mobile phone, we know quite a bit about you. Based on location and the inferences, we know when you're near McDonald's and you might be tempted to walk in and uh, deviate from your health care goal of um, not eating at a fast food restaurant, as an example. But there's also proximity sensors. You know when uh, the phone is near your face. They use, there's embedded sensors that we often don't think about that can be used to make inferences on people's activities, which in turn can lead us to estimates of clinical state, um, ambient light sensors, noise sensors. In fact, you can detect mood by voice quality, especially if you're using a person as their own control. Um, another, you can look at mobile phone alerts for asthma. You've probably heard of these asthma alerts that go out. But in fact, even within the home, there are now sensors that can measure nicotine level in the air. So this could be very valuable for a smoking cessation intervention. And smoking is one of the largest types of um, you know, health, health effects if you can, and it's been challenging from a clinical or medical point of view to really help people quit smoking. Another possible intervention on par with the importance of smoking is socialization. We're not thinking of that in the typical medical terms. Physicians aren't taught to address socialization, and yet if you look at mortality rates and health care costs, socialization's on par with, our, you know, with, with smoking, really dramatic. Um, talked about wristbands what they can get um, a variety of sensors right there they exist now these are maybe a little clunky but they'll get smaller and smaller and we're all looking forward to the new um, types of uh, smart watches coming out soon um, you can put balance sensors in the soles um, balance is a huge issue for older adults um, this is a cumbersome still type of um, headset, but you, you can imagine that more and more with hats, headbands, that we'll be seeing more EEG and um, brain computer interface. Um, you saw a picture like this, a variety of sensors that we're currently collecting data from about 20 different types of sensors in the home. We have 200 older adults looking at this. Um, and think about monitoring data from computer interactions. We look at linguistic complexity. We look at game interactions to measure memory, divided attention, executive function, um, a variety of approaches. And I'm going to, since we're short on time, um, move through some of these. But I wanted to emphasize just the simple motion sensors in the different rooms. You saw Misha Pavel present one of these before. Um, that we can start looking at sleep in the upper right-hand quadrant. You can tell this person was sleeping well the first half of the year and poor sleep in the uh, second half. But in order, the big data issues, you can collect a lot of information. And this is just one type of sensor for an individual. When you start to think about, well, how do I then compare it to this person? who lives in a residential facility and goes out for meals 
and you see the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you assume socialization. We can assume socialization when a person uses a phone. We look at number of contacts, number of email contacts, Skype usage. We measure when they're out of the home and in the home. Out of the home, we assume there's some degree of socialization. But the key big data issue here is that in order to do an, any intelligent alerting, we need to understand what's normal for a particular individual. These health interventions get better when you can tailor them. Um, you've seen simple motion sensors being able to record walking speed. Um, this person had a stroke two-thirds of the way into the monitoring period. Um, and there was clearly evidence of similar events before that. Looking at gradual decline gives us an estimate of cognitive decline well in advance of when it was diagnosed, again, about two-thirds of the way in, after a year and a half. Um, we can measure sleep quality with simple bed sensors, um, looking at center of mass changes, and compares to what you could record in a sleep lab study that costs typically 2000 a night. We're getting data on people much more frequently. Okay, I'm going to wind up with two slides. One listing what are the opportunities in this area, the other saying what are the challenges. So opportunity-wise, we need low-cost and scalable approaches to deal with these new types of health interventions in the home, and there's a wide spectrum of what you can provide. Um, it's new data. We haven't really looked at sleep quality over time and looked to see how that affects people's cognitive performance. How, how does walking speed, can we do those um, early detection algorithms? Um, we need to understand and improve health behavior change interventions. Um, and all of this requires this kind of continuous monitoring and understanding individual behavior from large amounts of data. We have the potential now to collect this data from a variety of sources, and yet we need to be able to put this into um, approaches that have interventions. And um, let's see if I can just... The, in the center here, we have a dynamic user model that is influenced by monitoring data and is able to d tailor messages that are drawn out based on active methods from a, our interface. But I wanted to emphasize one of the threads of this panel is multi-stakeholder. You're going to see much more team-based care these days. and. One untapped resource, I would say two actually, the patient themselves being more informed, an active part, and empowered to participate in their medical care decisions, but also family members that are very interested. Um, we have um, new methods of providing summarized data in privacy modeled data sharing capabilities. So to wind up with the implications though, the new analysis and modeling techniques are required to do this right. Um, we need advances in machine learning, data mining, sensor fusion. You're getting data about similar information from a variety of sources. You need metadata that describes this information and tells you how best to combine it to make high quality inferences. Um, one, one thing we haven't talked about very much is that a lot of this free ubiquitous data is context dependent. We need to explicitly model context. I see this as an important new area of research. Um, the privacy and security has been talked about a lot at this conference. And, but to think about, given the multiple stakeholders, the team-based care, who sees what data, how is it appropriately summarized? I'll leave it there as, as the, these being the key issues that I think are important in not just the size of the data, but the complexity and uh, variety of sources. You've, uh, you've opened it up. Dr. Gorsuch, would you like to take a question? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, I just think that it will uh, ask a question after everybody's You can ask more than one. Yeah. Uh, 
I think that's such a good question because data summarization has not been tailored to the individual stakeholders very well. We've seen um, physicians worry about being flooded with uh, patients that come in with internet documents and, and do this self-diagnosis. But most of the applications for health behavior change, the patients are the experts. Physicians haven't been trained in this area. The family members, the support group, it really has to be controlled about it's the healthcare is happening in the home. Physicians are good at diagnosing and prognosing, but they're not um, not well trained for any interventions to do with socialization, medication taking, for example. We can do much better reminding if we understand the context, can model the context, remind when they're near the dispenser, when they're likely to forget if they if they're leaving home. There's so many things that. We need to involve the patients because, and even connect them with other newly diagnosed patients because the patients themselves are the ones who have learned to cope and adapt to these kinds of strategies. At least they're anticipated. Most doctors don't do that because of the litigious nature of our society and because of what caused in the past. There's no anticipation. There's no effort to. Yeah, Thank you so interesting. Much. And when we're talking about privacy, I think we've got the quota party coming up today. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's yesterday, so we're fine. Uh oh, that's dangerous. Yes, high praise. Oh, I don't know about that. I um, first of all, I want to say it's great to be here. And some since it's like I just got uh, back, I'm not sure why. Is it another slide? Um, hold on a second. Is it? Oh. There's something fancy to do. Oh, great. Great. So I do feel like this is a bit of a homecoming. Um, so as I said, finally seeing people that I recognize that I've been away at the FTC. It's also a homecoming um, because past it is this particular conference is something that I, I have has my heart because it's always willing to embrace and sort of assess new uh, issues that are right on the forefront, and that's very commendable. Um, at the FTC, I'm no longer at the Federal Trade Commission. I was the uh, chief technology officer there. It was a fantastic opportunity, uh, uh, which I could go on about. Most people don't have a clue as to what the FTC did, does, and neither did I when I started. Uh, but it basically is so appropriate for this conversation because um, the FTC is basically America's little superhero. They're going around, they battle other government agencies, they work sort of tirelessly on behalf of the American consumer. And if you actually knew what they're, like I always said it was like being in Spider-Man's den. Like you, you just get to see all of the stuff that they do, but it's all shrouded in secrecy. And so the public, it's they've got to solve that problem. But I'm not here to talk about the FTC, but, um, but I do have to say that by the time I arrived at the FTC, I had then been in every position of all stakeholders of technology society clashes. And so being at the FTC for the first time gave, for me personally, gave me a platform and a position on which I could see all of the stakeholders in, and had been in every one of their positions. And that's been very profound and I do think it affects this conversation as well. The current conversation in D.C. around big data is very much about adverse impacts. In what way will the kind of things that you do create an adverse impact against Americans or cause personal harms? And so there are these terms like algorithmic accountability and so forth. Because one thing I already knew about privacy even before hanging out in D.C. is that privacy means lots of different things. But what it means to a community, a big data community, is it's about personal harms, it's about access to data, and it's about your work being disrupted because of an incident. And so somehow on the front end, you really need to kind of balance and think about those things in order to get to the back end. So let me talk a little bit about a project that I had before I went to the FTC called the Data Map. Um, 
When we obviously, geez, the slides just go on their own. When we think about the relationship between, in healthcare, we often think about the relationship between the patient and the physician. And what we were interested in are where are all the places that your data may go. Um, and this, we weren't the first to do so. In 1997, Paul Clayton led a group from the National Research Council to answer exactly that question. They listed this map, which caused a huge commotion at the time because most people didn't know the different places your health data would go. So we decided to replicate that. And as of last year, these were the sources that we were able to document. If you go to the datamap.org, you can actually click on a note and it will identify for you the exact uh, public source as to why we know that particular data sharing arrangement exists. Um, it, the dashed lines represent de-identified data and the, um, um, and the solid lines represent explicitly identified data. This is a list of all the companies that are identified there. I'm going to stop it because we don't really want to go through all 2,000, but it gives you a sense of the information. I want to instead talk to you a little bit that sort of ties into what the two people before me, the two presenters before me talked about, and that's the kind of data that they get and the access to it, in particular access. So if these are all the places that a patient's data might go, one of the things that's interesting is who is it that the patient would actually know got their data? So what you see highlighted here are flows that actually a patient was involved in the flow directly. And the, but you can see the overwhelming number of the flows are ones for which a patient would have no knowledge that their data were actually a part of. Another interesting thing is harms. There were, there were anecdotal uh, rumors and reports early on about how information that the person doesn't know can be used against them. So Linoz from the University of Chicago had done a survey where Fortune 500 companies admitted to making hiring, firing, and promotion decisions based on health data. It's totally illegal, um, and, but yet you could see from the data map one of the places they may be getting that data is this de-identified data from insurance companies. There, there was also a, a report in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, about a banker in Maryland who took, uh, public, uh, who took discharge data, we'll talk about that in a second, which is uh, sort of uh, registry data you might think of in his case, and he would link it with people who had credit card debt and mortgages and sort of tweak their credit worthiness based on it. So if you were ill, you, would, you, you, you might suffer a credit loss, you wouldn't necessarily know why. So these hidden, I'm not saying any of this happened because I didn't personally investigate any of it. I have no names to name or who to point to. But what I am saying, though, is that certainly from the data map, we see the likelihood of harms and no way for the individual to be able to know. Another thing that has come up is the issue of HIPAA. So HIPAA, for many of the data sources in healthcare, many of you may be getting your data in, in uh, you through. what HIPAA is? Because it's a lot of visitors. Oh, sorry. Thank you. HIPAA is the federal health regulation here in the United States. It sort of dictates who gets, uh, who holds what kind of data and what their rights and responsibilities are. It prescribes, and it only covers those involved in the direct medical care of the patient which means that there are many other places like state laws, um, data that I might give away about myself online, the quantified stuff I might measure about myself using Fitbit and so forth that are just not covered by HIPAA, meaning that they don't offer those kinds of protections or said another way, they have another opportunity. Another note here, uh, and I should point out Sean Hooley who's in the back there who's a party to a lot of this data uh, and the study we're gonna look at, um, comes, notice the discharge data sits really big. It's outside of HIPAA. Um, all, if any of you have been to a hospital or a physician in the United States, your data is, is in discharge data. It's a copy of the information about you during that visit that goes to the state. It includes diagnosis, procedures, and other kinds of information about you. And because it's not covered by HIPAA, many of the states either um, sell it or give it away. So these are the 33 states that either sell or share the personal health data that they collect, but only three of them do so in a way that's as strict as HIPAA. That means that 30 of the states are giving the data away in a standard that's not as strong as HIPAA. So it might be that HIPAA's too strong, or it could be that, um, uh, that the states are making the data more vulnerable. 
So we did a study where we purchased for $50 a one-year uh, supply of one year of copy, uh, one year's worth of hospital discharge data. That's everyone who had been in the hospital in the state of Washington in 2011. And this is an example of the kinds of fields that were there. So there are over 150 fields of data present, but it includes who paid for it, the diagnosis codes, and it also includes some demographics, the person's age in months, gender, zip code, and so forth. And then we went to one newspaper source and we looked at news articles that had appeared in the same time period. So, um, sort of police blotters often tell you about incidents that happened in the community. So this is an example of one that's reporting a motorcycle accident. This is exactly the same kind of data that goes back to those anecdotal examples. An employer could know about an employee who was absent from work. The same kind of thing a family member or a credit card company might know if you wanted, uh, wanted information. What is the things that they would know? How does it link up? Well, they certainly know your age, and so we can relate the age and year, but we also get it in months. It tells they know where the person is located, so that gives us a reference to their zip code and so forth. Uh, when the incident occurred, what the person's name is, uh, more information about it, and to what hospital they went. And so we wrote a, we, we mined out this information, which is kind of in a structured format, so it was kind of somewhat easy to mine out. And we we're interested in figuring out, could we figure out the health record from it? This is just straight matching, no statistical inferences involved. It had to match exactly. And if it didn't match anyone exactly, we would take out one field to see if it then matched exactly in the belief that it was an, a mistake in the hospital record. And what we were able to do is to, uh, to the cities show up in the news story and zip codes are, is what we need in the health data. So we just used a public record site to put zip codes to it, to the individual's data. And then we did this explicit matching. And what we were able to show was that 43% of the cases that we tried to, uh, tried to find had these unique and exact matches. Now, were they the right people? So Jordan Robertson is a, a reporter for Bloomberg News. And we made a deal with him and his editors and we gave them the names of all the people and, and they agreed to contact each and every one to see if we were correct. They also agreed that they wouldn't publish any one story unless the person agreed. Because within those stories were businessmen, there were professional athletes and their medical conditions, there were co congressmen and other elected officials. And, so the, and some of the kinds of things that were also recorded were drug use, um, sexual, um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and things like that. So, um, and so what they were able to find was that, in fact, every single one of them was correct, which was pretty amazing. The other thing that we were able to do through using a Freedom of Information Act uh, with the help of Bloomberg News' attorneys, was we issued a Freedom of Information Act to every state and asked them, who, are the top, who did you give this data to? Who did you sell it to or give it to? And what you see here are the top buyers, the top purchasers or acquirers of that data. W one of the things that's kind of interesting is, I think going into it, our expectation would be that we would see the Harvards and the Yales and the Stanfords, that is, kind of a notion that the top purchases or acquirers of the data would be research organizations. But in reality, the top list that you see, are uh, uh, even beyond this list, is dominated by data analytic companies. Companies who are acquiring data to make bigger data sets to produce data products. And um, which I find very interesting. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the FTC was also on the data map, which is also kind of funny. But, um, but there are also many, what WebMD, who could link it to online information they have about you, IMS Health, whose business model is pharmacy purchases, what you get. The SEIU is a union, and we could talk about why they have it. So I don't mean to always be the bearer of bad news or try to put water on the fire. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, I'm a computer scientist by training, so clearly, I believe in technology. I want technology society to have the benefits of technology. But I also believe that we can do so in a way that does not necessarily risk disruption because of an incident or cause harm because we force an all or nothing situation. 
So I, one of the things that I like to do is to point out these kinds of vulnerabilities so that we get better methods, so that we can, can produce a cycle to sort of bring up the floor. So information about this is actually was blogged about on the FTC site, and I'm, I have some way, uh, they're also on there some ways that perhaps we might move forward. Thank you. Question for you, no. or shall I open it up to the audience? Questions? <laughs> this is not very challenging. Uh, yes. Please. Right. You can't too for fifty dollars. Well, you you can't now because of this ruckus that we created. They passed the law to change what happens in Washington State, but that's only in one state. The other states haven't necessarily followed that pursuit. But that's actually sort of the point, right? The point is that there are many ways that I might get access to the data. Going through the individual is also free of HIPAA. That also has no HIPAA restrictions on it. <laughs> so if you, if you go to the datamap.org, there is a link that actually includes the contact information for all of the hospital district's data that were in the survey. If you looked at the 50 state survey. Can we there. provide some of these links for everybody because yeah. they're in stun mode at the moment. I think. Well, the datamap.org, if you don't remember, but otherwise we will definitely provide the excellent. links. Excellent, excellent. Well, I hate to, no? Okay. So the question was, is whether or not people can give consent. And the, the kind of, there are two answers to that. One answer is the lawyer answer that says, yes, if you give consent, then, it's, then you can do what you want. There's the growing uh, answer that we don't actually know how to frame consent anymore in this environment. And so what we need to do is just add transparency instead yes. of consent. So the idea that a person might know, if you hold my data, I can ask you and you have to tell me, or you have to provide not an audit trail just within the organization of where personal data, like the hospitals do, but what happens when it crosses boundaries. That's another idea that's been floated. But in general, a belief that um, consent is probably not going to, uh, there's a lot of pressure that consent is not the right thing. I personally, you know, it's ethics. I'm a computer scientist. I try to keep in my own boundary. And I have a personal uh -oh. view. But, uh, don't deal with the multi-stakeholders. <laughs> well, no, I can deal with them. I just don't want to. Just uh, don't. Just, I want to stay in my <laughs> space. Yeah. Well, I think probably lunch should be full of questions. And last but not least, and because I can't be charged with having a gender-specific uh, panel, we have Dr. Simon Atkinson from the University of Sydney. Um, uh, and he's going to give us a fantastic example of a tall, very long time followed the norm. Can I have a hand bringing up uh, my poster screen? Uh, risk and resilience. Um, I think it's on the desk. That's that one. Okay, so uh, I'm going to look at the um, <coughs> Blue Mountains, and um, as most of you get, I'm uh, Australian despite a very English accent. I spent many years in the UK. And um, so essentially um, what we're looking at was the fires that occurred last year in uh, October 2013. And we looked at this in terms of a synthetic ecology, this idea that we are so connected, entangled in that quantum sense with the technology that you can no longer divide the information from the technology or the social from the uh, IT, highly coupled. And then we looked at that idea of, if you like, an ecological identification, what the fire ecology looks like. And we're looking at the Blue Mountains area around Sydney. Now, this is a vast area. It um, essentially encompasses um, uh, an area the size of Belgium, the country of Belgium, 
And the Blue Mountains uh, National Park itself is the size of the country of Wales in the United Kingdom. So it's a major area. It has this very evolved fire ecology. And as most, most of you will know, the fire ecology of Australia is quite unique. A lot of the plants, the flora, the fauna, are actually devised around that particular fire uh, ecology. So they'll only germinate as a result of fire going through. The issue, though, is one of resilience. So as you can see here, the headlines in the Sydney Morning Herald after these fires, that there's some 200,000 uh, homes, uh, uh, 200,000 people in danger and a million homes, particularly in the northern swathe, which we'll look at in a second across uh, the whole of uh, in New South Wales and that area around Sydney. And in fact, uh, we're a very elemental country, as most of you will know. We have the top mo 10 most dangerous animals I think uh, we heard five shark attacks in this country. I think we had that before breakfast in Western Australia on sort of January the 1st. Um, so we also have fires and floods. And actually the biggest threat of Sydney is not necessarily fires, it's actually floods along the Hawkesbury River. This is the sort of ecology that we're looking at then. And you can see in that top half, I'm sorry, I've got no tools here whatsoever. Can but you find it? Is there? So around here is that green swathe of the Blue Mountains, the eucalyptus trees that come right the way around here. And it's quite unique. The reason they're called the Blue Mountains is because of the eucalypti, uh, which leads to an aerosol, which gives that blue color. But it's also that combination of the aerosol and the trees that means that the what struck by lightning, they'll literally explode these trees and they'll burn for a long period of time and then catch fire. So a vast area that we're looking at. This is something that we looked at because w we spoke yesterday about different generations and what we found was that um, we have very many different definitions of uh, time period with the very different sort of generations. So in a different paper, we looked at this 14-year generational uh, perspective, which reduced the baby boomers from 45 to 64 to a standard 14 years, and then the generation next, generation Y. These two are 20, 22 years, and then the millennials and the recessionals. So this is a way that we've looked at different areas of trying to provide a standard base for when we're comparing different generations and different characteristics from those generations. So what we also looked at is instabilities, and when I say we, one of the key issues that we've been trying to do is to move from this course-based uh, lecturing where you set the lecture, you examine the lecture, um, and then you sort of report back on that lecture to your students. So we, what we're looking at is coursework research, taking undergraduates, and they were given the task of creating an ecological fire risk register of um, the Blue Mountains following the fires, and then they actually had to go and present their results to well over 100 people in Lawson up in the Blue Mountains. And this was results presented by poster and by presentations, many of whose fires, houses had actually been burnt down during the fires. So what we looked at here is a complex instability. And what we were saying essentially was that you have this business where you've got a human aspect. So in the designs for houses on the, on the Blue Mountains are very many changes of land use that existed beforehand. You then have an aspect here of uh, the technological. The fires were, three of the five, six fires were started, in fact, by strikes from the power cables, and leading with some kind of complex instability where you've got an admixture of the physical to the human. An example there is the Morwell town. But as soon as you're into a major fire, you're into some kind of complex instability that includes the sort of design and other bits. What we were looking at was this need to move from a prevent to engage to recover and recognising for most of the time we should hopefully be in that prevent phase. The big data analysis that we looked at was quite significant because what we were showing, the reason I'm doing this is I've got no ability to read what's up there here. So it's a hopeless system at the moment. So what we saw was that since the European sector came into uh, into New South Wales and Australia, that we were no longer managing fire. The indigenous and Aboriginal populations managed fire. They kept it low. So the original photographs of 200 years ago, or paintings of 200 years ago, actually showed almost a sort of estate, a grass-like estate, probably that it, like existed in large parts of New England. Um, 
But over a period of time, change of land use, we have this build-up of fires. Combination of not simply climate change and microclimate change, but also the change of land use, the ribbon house developments along the escarpments of the Blue Mountains, meant that we'd reduced what was a 70-year fire phase or fire season to a 50-year. So what we actually see here is you've got 20 years now, which is a cooling phase where we're topping up that vast area. You then have a trigger event where it's become increasingly unstable, and then we go through a fire phase, which is now 30 years. During a fuel phase, you can be up to 20, 22 years between major fires. During a fire phase, you're only eight years. So if we think about the forgetting and learning curve, for a long period of time, we're actually forgetting what happened in the previous fires. It's no longer relevant to us. That education message has gone. So when we broke down and looked at the cost of the fires, one of the significant things that we see here is a rural fire service and a state fire service, obviously significant costs. The rural fire service is entirely voluntary. So it's that volunteer network that is so important to recovery and resilience, as we'll look at in the future. Housing insurance. Because of changes in legislation, a significant amount of our houses were underinsured. Because when they're rebuilt, they now all, you have a protective roof, and it's the angle of the roof that protects, if you like, houses from fires and ash and all the rest of it allows the burning ash to actually come off the house roof itself. So significant underinsurance. Health. We were very lucky last year because the fire struck during the day and we were able to evacuate people in schools and elsewhere. Over 200 houses were destroyed. If this fire had happened overnight, the calculation was that we'd have suffered up to 200 fatalities. But fatalities aren't the major cost. The major cost is actually in that third and fourth level of people who are injured and PTSD, and those people who suffer tremendously from the effect of the loss of house, the loss of property, the loss of business. That's the major cost that we have in there. And then mitigation. Anne mentioned this before. The real cost of litigation is in its freezes everything. It stops people dancing back. And the result that we saw in the Victorian fires, for example, was that mitigation meant that um, because the, uh, most of the fires were these power strikes from the pylons, that the power companies would be litigated against, and so then they switched off the, they switched off the power, and as a result of which, of course, we had people dying from heat stress. So we've actually got more people dying from heat stress as a result of this nonsensical litigation than we had before from the risk of fire from a particular strike. So what essentially we looked at and prioritised was this idea that actually we had life and culture and heritage, that that aspect of volunteers and volunteerism was a significant aspect. Then it was uh, environment and finally property. And the critical thing in a major fire, which was a mindset, was that you had to be able to walk away from your house in 10 minutes. So what are you going to do with the cat or the dog? You have literally got to be in this environment to be out of that house in 10 minutes. So what's your plan? One of our, 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 our very intelligent uh, female students came up with the idea of using an ELSA system, which is actually a 10-minute supply of air used in all our combat ships. But if they hit, there's men and women who have the size fingers can get up. They've got 10 minutes of extra, uh, extra air that they can breathe. Brilliant little idea, simple. Something they have in the house that gives them 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes. What we also looked, though, at, and again using big data, was could we reduce uh, the costs of that prevent and recovery period? And we thought actually that five years, if we could reduce it to three years, that would have a significant impact. It didn't. What it turned out to be was that the major saving was in reinvigorating those volunteer networks. That very often, for every dollar properly spent on a volunteer network, you can actually get up to $10 back. And this was a, a feature that we've seen in New Zealand and indeed uh, following the, the major fires here and Sandy uh, over a few years ago. So a major conclusion there was that $15 million pounds could be reduced to $10, $10, sorry, $10 million a year instead. What we also looked at, and this is where Generation Y was, came into town, was what we had is this emergency occurred and your social gap was completely wiped out. You've then got all these people, hundreds of people coming to the emergency headquarters, and you've got all these NGOs, 
tax office, believe it or not, and everyone else. And people were going there, they were having to hand their information out around 20 or 30 times. This information was being lost. We had to capture that information so that we sent the raw file service to, to the right people. Well, it's a way. I could tell you that, but I've had to spend ages here trying to get that data through. So how do we actually create a system where we can capture that data once, uh, in this case, using a QR code generated for people, maintaining a level of privacy because you contain and own that code and you decide on source or beforehand who that's going to go to in the emergency headquarters, to the Sally's Army, the Salvos as we'd call them, or to the, uh, the Red Cross, the Australian Red Cross, and so on and so forth. So this is an area where Generation Y has come in trying to solve and look at that nexus between security and privacy and retain privacy, but recognising how important it is to create what we call that dynamic social map. But also, when we talk about that, the white frequency management. You've got all these NGOs and all these individuals, and they're operating on a different frequency. Their language is different to someone else's language. So how do we reconnect that language so that we're looking at the same people? So we recreate that social map that's been burnt out or destroyed by flood or fire. So these are areas, again, where big data and that rapid capture can be really, really helpful. And then finally is this move towards resilience. And some of our analysis has shown that actually that sustainability is antithetical to resilience. I mentioned it yesterday in terms of trust being antithetical to privacy. I think there's a real issue here that we need to dig into as scientists. But this is what we're looking at it here, risking the observers of trust, that ability to respond, to reflect, to bounce back, and that alternative definition. And our subsequent work has actually led the way for the Sid city of Sydney to take up the Rockefeller uh, as a 100 resilience challenge and has now become one of those cities uh, of, of resilience. Major city. Now, I've got one point that I'd like to make. Big data. My indigenous population, if you're a young, black, indigenous, Aboriginal, living in Australia, your average age is 43. A third of the male population is dying every 10 years from the age of 13. That is not acceptable. It's not much better for women. It's 65. It's the same in our inner cities, in the UK and in America. This is unacceptable. And it's unacceptable because we're losing the stock. These guys, I want to be engineers, and I want them to come through and solve some of the complex, abstract problems we've got in the future. We can't afford to lose them. And part of the solution for our big data is how do we engage? How do we stop losing these folk? So it's a final plea, but that's the resilience. Here, here. your duty. Questions? And, and also, uh, at this point in time, I mean, we need to think about how that encourages kids to participate and expect beyond the Respondent International. I think the anticipation is the excuse because of the sense of education. I mean, if you're asking somebody to make a decision, you're giving them information that has no context to the male understanding until you go to the ground where you have. Yeah, and I, I think you're right, this, this education, you see, one of the problems we have in higher education at the moment is the, the degree of plagiarism. And, um, you, you know, you can go to a company now and they'll produce you the essays. So you, we either go back to old-fashioned examinations, and there's a big call for that, or we've got to find a different way. We live in a really visual, visual environment, a visual ecology, if you like. So I think increasingly we need to be able to test our, our and educate our young people so that they can operate in that and be tested in that environment. In, indeed. indeed. Thank you all. It was just dynamic and uh, I hope that you all uh, will follow up and, and get those links because there's just no way you can make it all information and that's what you uh, we're very grateful for it and all the time. Thank you. Before we go for a lunch, uh, we want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, first today's session chair, Dr. Marcy Cross from Harvard University. I request Dr. Justin Jhan to give this uh, certification appreciation.
want to also acknowledge and appreciate on the behalf of Academy of Science Engineering today's uh, panel discussion, uh, NAC better. I request Dr. Justin Jhan to give it. It was a very easy assignment. No, we have a certificate for each one. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> Dr. May Wang. Dr. Holy Gibson. Dr. Latinia Sini. Dr. Simon Ray Rickton. Thank you all.